Hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to our talk event uh, today. Uh, my name is Ai Hisano from BI Global Forum and the uh, Graduate School of Interdisciplinary Information Studies at the University of Tokyo. Uh, I will be moderating the discussion today. Uh, today's talk is uh, entitled The uh, Collective Memory, Disconnection, and the Digital Transformation of Witness Testimony in Museum Settings by uh, Professor Richard Carter White. So uh, thank you uh, for uh, giving the talk. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Professor, Professor Carter White. So uh, this is actually the second time uh, we are hosting uh, Richard's talk, so it is really nice to have you back. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Carter White is a senior lecturer in human geography uh, at the School of Social Sciences at Macquarie University. And his research uh, sits at the intersection of cultural and political geography and provides a geographical perspective on structures, spaces, representations, and experiences of violence. And, I'm a, and you, you are involved in many different projects, but today's talk uh, focuses on the implications and role of AI in the context of contemporary museums. Um, okay, so without further, further ado, uh, I will turn to uh, Richard. So. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, thanks so much for that lovely introduction, Professor Hisano, and um, again to the BAI Forum for being so generous and hosting my visit and arranging this, this talk. I've been really looking forward to this um, for the past couple of months now, and it's great to, to be here. And um, it's so kind also for all of you to have come during this busy time. So thank you very much. Uh, should I do something for the uh, share screen? Yeah. Okay. All right. So just a quick, um, oops, just a quick content warning about this um, this talk. I'm going to be talking just in very general terms about the Hiroshima um, um, Peace Memorial Museum, and in even more general terms about Holocaust museums. I'm not going into any detail on any events or. Um, uh, particular images or exhibits, and I'll also be talking just in general conceptual terms about the concept of trauma, uh, again fairly briefly. And so, oops, the basic uh, premise of this talk is that witness testimony, survivor testimony, is an often key and central feature of all sites of, of difficult heritage, or at least the ones that I've encountered in the course of my research. And by difficult heritage, I'm just referring to places of historical significance, which are related to, to violence and collective trauma, and that people tend to visit for heritage purposes. And what this talk is ultimately about is how has testimony and museums' use of testimony been transformed during the digital age? And this is super early speculative work in contrast to the finished paper that I presented with March in December last year. Um, so I'm really just glad to have the opportunity today to test out these ideas and try and get them in order before for an audience. So I, I don't need to linger on this too much, thanks to Professor Hisano, but you've heard about my interest. I mean, I'm a geographer interested in both cultural and political phenomena. And much of my work just keeps coming back to this question of witness testimony, which as I'll elaborate later in the lecture, is something that's both incredibly simple but also mind-bogglingly complicated too and, and, and fascinating. And it's that tension that always seems to, to draw me back and that I'm now looking to explore in a digital context. Um, so in this lecture, I wanna discuss a really interesting development in contemporary museums and in, in particular Holocaust museums, which is the use of AI, artificial intelligence, to present the testimony and memory of survivors in a, a new and interactive way. 
Um, this is a really interesting development to me, this combination, because to my mind, witness testimony and AI, and bearing in mind I know punishingly little about AI, but just in sort of general terms, are opposite things. The values I associate with testimony and AI are quite opposite. And I want to start just by explaining why I conceive of these in oppositional terms. I'll start with um, AI. So firstly, there are all manner of possibilities and potential for using AI um, in museums, all manner of ways it might be used to sort, categorize, present, make accessible information to people in ways which are engaging and innovative. But again, just without claiming expertise, just in terms of populist discourse, popular imagination around AI, it is often considered in terms of distrust, misinformation, deception. Think of the kind of earth-shaking ramifications of chat GPT and, and what that's wrought in educational journalistic settings. Think about questions of creative and artistic integrity. Um, discrimination being both designed into but also hidden behind seemingly objective algorithms. Just a very quick search on the Guardian website brought these headlines and look at the language. It's an image AI knocks up. It can't be trusted. It discriminates. Um, so what immediately set, comes to my mind there is that museums looking to use AI have one challenge, which is how to get over, how to address the basic hurdle of popular mistrust around this technology. And this question of trust in AI has been made really clear to me by two of my colleagues, Dr. Andrew Lapworth, who's in the room right today, and Dr. Tom Roberts at the University of New South Wales, Canberra. And we're looking to work together on a bigger project exploring the relation between AI and trust. But so, that's one side of this opposition to me, is this association with mistrust and deception. So then the other side, witnessing, witness testimony. Firstly, I use the word witnessing quite loosely, um, as does much of the academic literature. I'm not talking so much in the kind of formal legal sense, but more generally thinking about regular people reporting on something that they've seen or perceived from a position of proximity, closeness, or from personal experience. It can be spoken, written, any other communicative form. And again, I, I would believe this is a, a mainstay of museums. I was intending to illustrate my thoughts on, my initial thoughts on witnessing in relation to a very famous Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. But a couple of weeks ago, I had the chance to visit the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum and I was so struck by how testimony is used in that place, that I kind of felt compelled to bring it into this lecture. So this is not a lecture about the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. I'm not an expert in that or in Japanese witnessing practices more generally, but I think it's a useful illustration of some of the values around testimony that I'd like to talk about. Um, so I, I went two weeks ago and I was just, I'm really interested by how witness testimony is present in the Hiroshima Museum from start to finish. I went on a busy day, maybe every day is a busy day there, so I was queuing for quite a while. And even as you're waiting to enter, there was this advertisement in the bottom left there um, for a kind of witnessing, albeit one offered not by first-hand witnesses, but by people who have come later, who have inherited in some way that testimony. That's already a, a whole different project, a fascinating thing I want to think more about, but already just in the queue before the museum, witnessing is there. And then the entrance sign in the top right, it promises to show the reality under the atomic bomb. And then you enter the museum with not much more political or historical context. So you're going straight into the experience of the victims. And so of course then, to try and get to that, testimony is very prominent throughout. And then the very first exhibit in the bottom right there is a short testimonial quotation. So the beginning is testimony, testimony, testimony. Um, again, there'll be no um, images of anything other than captions in this um, presentation. But so throughout the museum, there were many exhibits dedicated to individuals, individual stories, sometimes quite long of, of several 
installations, sometimes just a few words or a snapshot. And these were written reports, poems, drawings, all of which had a testamentary quality to some degree. And then the audio narration that I was listening to would sometimes adopt the first person perspective of the witness too. Um, then after the exhibition, there was the opportunity to view more um, witness testimony, either in a group setting, sat together watching a large screen, or in individual booths and uh, looking at, at a small screen where you can select um, testimony according to criteria of your choosing. Um, and then the final part of the exhibition was themes around preserving and conveying testimony. And there were several books um, available afterwards offering collections of eyewitness testimony that you could purchase as well. And I, I brought some along, happy to, to show them later on today to those in the room. Um, you, you get, I've said enough already, testimony was, was integral to this museum, absolutely central. So why is it then that witness testimony is so central to sites of difficult heritage? And I'm gonna circle back to that opposition in a moment, by the way. Um, there are all manner of academic perspectives I could offer to um, answer this question. But basically after visiting that museum, it also seemed like a simple answer too. The use of testimony was just extremely moving and powerful and often upsetting because of how it renders this enormous event, which to me exists as purely as, as history, as an abstraction. It renders this thing to some tiny degree more imaginable. I'm not to say I can possibly imagine that reality, but there's something there I can imaginatively connect with. Scenarios, situations that, are, that anybody perhaps can empathize with. Um, and of course, that the nature of that empathy will be different for different visitors. That's not a, a universal experience. But together, we might think of these things, I don't really like this term, but we to use it briefly, we can think of this as a kind of humanizing effect, making this large event more personal, small scale, emotionally relatable, based on the closeness of certain people to that event. And of course, there's the fact that for extreme events like this, it is irreplaceable as evidence. Now, to me, this is, again, thinking of, of Andrew and, and Tom's work, this is really important for sites of difficult heritage, because institutions like museums, they take on a big responsibility by acting effectively as the curators, the guardians, the protectors, the narrators of collective history, a history that many people have very strong vested interest in being told correctly, and it's museums who have responsibility to try and do that. And so I'm thinking by, by grounding their narrative in testimony, it can draw on the credibility that is, tends to be given to the people we call witnesses, a sort of aura of authenticity, insider knowledge, validity, trustworthiness, or values that are the opposite of how AI tends to be thought of. So it was a rather exhausting route, but this is the opposition that I'm, I'm sketching out here. Um, and maybe it's no coincidence that as far as I could see, all of the testimony in the Hiroshima Museum was offered in more traditional formats, sort of insistently analog in its presentation, because I think there is a tension there between these two oppositions. Um, so that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the Hiroshima Museum today. But I hope it's illustrated the tension that occupies my, my thoughts in this lecture, which is how have the apparent opposites of AI and witness testimony come together, converged in contemporary Holocaust museums? And what does this convergence mean for how we understand both AI and testimony in the context of difficult heritage? So I've got a very concrete example I'm going to talk through. I hope that's going to be interesting to anyone doing work around AI. But before getting into that, I just want to talk briefly about some of the ideas around testimony that really sort of animate my, my passions in this, this topic. So as I mentioned, witnessing, 
witness testimony at first glance is basically simple. It's, what appeals to me is almost the most simple thing you could possibly imagine. Witnesses are those with proximity to an event. They are close to something who are able to tell about it in a truthful way. In a sense, that's the start and end of testimony. We can, if we want, we can finish the conversation there. For once, Derrida is the, also the voice of simplicity in this discussion. Uh, this is a, a really helpful book by Derrida on the far left there, Fiction and Testimony, that is a beautiful introduction to the work around witnessing. And he says, that, referring to a more legal context, the closeness, the position of the witness to the thing makes the witness irreplaceable. They possess knowledge and experience that no one else has. And that's why we place so much value on their voices. Fine, fair enough. However, as indicated by the huge amount of work, especially in the last 25, 30 years, to come out around this, this idea of witnessing, there's actually nothing straightforward about it at all. And it somehow manages to become the most complex thing you can imagine too. I think it's that tension that sort of fascinates me. And much of this complexity comes back to the word truth and truthful and what it means to tell what you've experienced in a truthful way. So I'm gonna um, just, just cover some ground very, um, in a very sort of summary way. We're not gonna spend too much time in terms of testimony theory, but just for five minutes or so, I think it's really important to think about how testimony functions before getting into its AI iteration. So one type of testimony, a uh, truth in testimony, perhaps the most obvious one, is the legal scientific expectation that testimony must be factually accurate, must tell the facts in an accurate, sort of empirically valid, valid way. It should be consistent, it should align with what other kinds of evidence is saying, it should hold up under cross-examination, and I'm veering into sort of legal talk here, and so on. And that again may seem obvious, but as the field of trauma studies has made clear, the same proximity, the same closeness to extreme events, but on the one hand make someone a very credible witness, can also make it incredibly difficult or impossible to remember, to recollect in an exact scientific way. And I'm thinking in particular here of the work of Kathy Carruth, um, who's shown how traumatic experience makes remembering, and especially voluntary recollection, really hard because of the way that things like fragmented images and memories might appear in involuntary way through flashbacks or just through gaps and errors in memory. And so the one response might be, well, people experiencing that, I'm sorry, but that can't really be treated as testimony. But as these the theorists, and again, Karuf in particular has made clear, if someone who has lived through traumatic events struggles to re re um, recall that or does so inaccurately, it's simply too simplistic and, and blunt to suggest this makes the witness's testimony untruthful or unreliable or lacking credibility, partly out of basic decency and, and sensitivity. But there's also a deeper philosophical issue here. The idea that if there is an error in the testimony of someone who has survived an extreme or traumatic event, then the error in their testimony might itself be regarded as a kind of testimony, a symptom, an imprint of the traumatic event on the mind and psyche of the witness. What I'm saying is we might think of faulty testimony as an accurate or faithful way of representing an event that defies simple representation. And the work of the geographer Paul Harrison here was really, I, I constantly go back to that as another sort of point of inspiration. It's because somebody can't talk about something easily, but we get a sense of what that thing was like. If it can't be looked at directly, it's by seeing how our gaze is deflected from it. We can at least see its outline. 
So the idea that error is itself a way of bearing witness for an event that can't be easily described in words. And I, I'm gonna, I always enjoy paying tribute to my inspirations. So maybe this book more than any other has taught me about that. This is the, uh, the testimony of the Auschwitz survivor, Charlotte Delbo, which is very well known. And this, this quote is an oft quoted one. But I think it's magnificent. Today, I am not sure that what I wrote is true. I am certain it is truthful. So I'm not sure that everything in my testimony is empirically accurate. But survive, surviving Auschwitz doesn't lend itself to perfect memory. And there is a deeper truth contained in these words. Um, I, I made myself cut out a lot more talk around this related to the work of Primo Levi, who's another inspiration. I also had to cut a fascinating digression on the meaning of the word bear, as in bear witness. Just to point out, this word maybe gets ignored often when we talk about witnessing, but look at the meanings it has. To produce, to, to carry, to be responsible, to suffer. Another way of saying bearing witness is suffering witness. Of course, testimony to extreme events will be imperfect. And it's incumbent, I think, on audiences to understand and to, to work with that imperfection. But that's all been cut, so please remove that from the record. Um, instead, I just want to, this is to some extent still a digression. The key point, the only thing that really needs to be grasped from all this is that there are many kinds of truth to testimony. There is much more than just empirical accuracy. There are other kinds of truth. And going back, so I can't stop, going back to the Hiroshima Museum, as I was walking through that exhibition, was I thinking about accuracy? Was I wondering if this is a perfect depiction? No, of course, that was the last thing from my mind and from the minds, I've no doubt, of everyone else in the museum. It's instead, what is overwhelming was the fact that the person was there that this is what their mind and soul looked like when they tried to share that experience. Not emotional accuracy, but emotions, not measurable accuracy, but emotional power, emotional insight was what was occupying all of my attention. And look, I'm not meaning to downplay the importance of accuracy in, in testimony. And of course, there are many contexts, not least in the history of the Holocaust and related to Holocaust denial, where it's super important to have a measurable, accurate record of events. But for museums, I think there is scope to be open to the multiple truths of testimony and to think about what that can, how that can educate in different ways. So speaking of which, the multiple truths of testimony, what does that mean ultimately for museums? Well, if we agree, but testimony functions in various different ways and doesn't have just one kind of truth, then witnessing is not just the responsibility of the witness. The audience who reads or listens to testimony also bears responsibility to receive testimony in a sensitive way, to be able to listen with empathy and compassion and above all maybe attention and try to make one's own sense of what is said, but also what is unsaid or what is missaid. In other words, I think survivor testimony demands an active, responsible audience, an audience who can work to try and understand and sometimes to try and decode what might be obscure or confusing or just bubbling under the surface in testimony. And so this to me is adds another dimension for why testimony is so important for sites of difficult heritage. I've already mentioned the big responsibility museums bear in telling the history of a large group of people. And again, especially the case for difficult heritage. By their very nature, large scale traumatic events affect many people and will be interpreted and understood in different ways and ways that will change over time as well. So this is nothing new to say this, but of course museums need to be sensitive and careful in how they tell these histories. And one way of doing that is to interrupt the official voice of the museum 
with multiple voices from witnesses, which not only add to the diversity of the narrative, but because of the multiple truths of testimony, it encourages the active participation of visitors, of audiences, who are required to make their own sense of the testimonial voice. So witness testimony has a really important role in building participation and engagement, but also emotional investment and even trust in audiences too. And this is confirmed by a great paper by Aragoni and Galani, who writes that the recent orientation in museum practice towards assembling the monologic format of the testimony in more dialogic orchestra. That's a, that's a sentence that works when you write it down. Don't ever, ever try and say it, take my advice. All it's saying is recent efforts by museums to make testimony not one way, but into a conversation. But this is happening. This is important for museums. And finally, we're getting to AI because it's happening through the use of digital technologies. Museums are embracing digital technologies to try and make what is inherent to testimony explicit and, and to maximize that, to make testimony this incredible participatory dialogic thing through digital technology. Whew, so this was a, a, a large ship to turn around, but we finally got to the thing, 21 minutes into the talk, which is artificial intelligence, AI. That's what I wanna really talk about here today, this fascinating example that I've encountered but embodies all the stuff I've just been saying. So the, the, the example of um, artificial intelligence that sparked this lecture and my part in the, the bigger project that I'm now um, working on is called Dimensions in Testimony. And in a nutshell, this project is using AI to simulate the experience of having a conversation with a Holocaust survivor and witness. And I'll go into how it does that in a moment, but the headline news for me is that what this is doing is taking all of the interpretive work of audiences that I just mentioned and making it literal by forcing audiences to engage in conversation, to listen and ask questions if they want to receive testimony from a witness. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So this dimensions in testimony, it's been, it's an ongoing development. Um, the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation began working on this in 2010. And how it works is a, a survivor who is participating in this will take part in a recording session for about one week, during which they are, uh, they will answer up to 1000 questions about their life covering the pre, during, and post-war um, experiences. And they're recorded in a 360 degrees green screen environment, which allows the video to then be projected in different ways um, in the future. And every answer the survivor gives is recorded separately from one another. So 1,000 answers, 1,000 video clips. And then, during a session in the museum, as a visitor, you can go and sit down in front of a screen or in some cases a hologram where, and you'll be facing an image of the survivor who is sat in kind of a resting pose. You can see them breathing. It's like someone just sat in front of you and you can ask a question into a microphone. And then the Dimensions in Testimony system uses natural language technology, please don't ask me to clarify what exactly that is, but it uses that natural language technology to translate the question into a search term, which is meaningful within that system. And then the search term is matched up with the most appropriate answer clip out of the thousand or so that have been recorded. And so a conversation ensues. You ask a question and then an answer related to your question hopefully answering the question is given back to you. And it's like a conversation. Really important to clarify straight away, but nothing that the, the machine says to you is generated by AI. It, is sim it has been recorded and the recording is played to you. Nothing is generated by AI. Instead, the role of AI is to recognize and match questions with answers. 
which is already an extraordinary thing. If you think of all the different ways any number of people could ask the same question, uh, that's where the sophistication of this technology comes in. And so it will get better and better at matching up questions to answers as it learns from all the different questions that it's being fed. And the developers state that this is not intended, it could never replace real conversations with survivors. But in time, as time moves on, this will become one of the perhaps primary ways of interacting with um, survivors of the, um, of the Holocaust and other events that it might be used for. Now, I I've, I've used this um, back in August last year with Professor Yaguchi, who also was in, was in Sydney at the time. And I was obviously fascinated. In a way, it seemed quite odd. Like, it, it's no different in terms of old fundamental outcomes, perhaps, than simply selecting testimony from a video catalog. That's what you're doing. You are selecting testimony clips, but in a much more elaborate, and if it were being unkind, a less efficient way than just selecting from a catalog, perhaps. Except, and so what is added is this feeling of having a conversation. And by the way, these links at the bottom there, there's some, some good videos that um, illustrate this, which I, I wasn't sure about playing because of copyright reasons, but those links are very easily findable. Dimensions in Testimony is the name of this project. Um, so yeah, it was super interesting. I tried it out with an audience of about 10 people um, when it was still being experimented upon and being fed new questions. And um, when I tried it, the survivor, I'm not sure what the correct term to use, the virtual survivor was able to answer with an appropriate quest, uh, response about 50% of the time, I'd say roughly. And then in other cases, it was either a somewhat unrelated answer, or it couldn't really recognize the question. It would ask me to repeat it. And in the room was also a, a live human, a, a mediator, who could help us with how to phrase our questions in ways that might be better recognized by the AI. Um, and it, in some ways, it really did take on the, the qualities of a real conversation. But without any instructions, I, Professor Yaguchi, the other people in the room, we all referred to the virtual survivor by his name. We couldn't help but, we couldn't lose that basic social nicety. And we were all waiting and, and taking turns politely to, to ask our questions. Um, so in some ways it was very realistic, but there were some weird moments too, some jarring moments. Of course, my question was not recognized. I asked a, an inconvenient question, I wanted to know about what kind of everyday experience was like in, um, in the camp and what line of sight was like um, from the, where the person was mainly living. And it, I mean, it's hard to ask that question even to a, a live human. And mine didn't really generate much of a response. But also in, in testimony, there tends to be a sort of chronological rhythm to these things. You, you get past a certain point, and then normally you can't really ask about it. But because there was no human to offend, I was happy once we'd passed the camp part of the testimony to bring it back and say, no, no, I'm not finished yet. I want to know about this. But it was kind of rude to the other people in the room too. So there's still live human dynamics happening, even if you're not going to hurt the feelings of the survivor. So all kinds of, of interesting stuff going on there. And... I mean, this is a really major development in how witness testimony is used by museums. It is completely challenging head on that the logic of testimony from a monologue to a dialogue. And so accordingly, already a, a interesting academic literature has started to emerge. This book on the right is um, just came out this year, a fantastic early study that gets into both the production and to some extent the reception of dimensions in testimony by Bos well and Rowland. Um, and they offer, they, you know, it's a very reasoned argument, I think, but they do offer some quite important critiques. They mentioned, for example, that the illusion of conversation is actually quite superficial, perhaps, and certainly very one-sided. Um, as an audience, we ask questions partly in response to previous answers. We might say, oh, you said this before, but how about this? But of course, the machine isn't reflecting on previous answers and modifying the answers in real time. It's, it's just one answer at a time 
atomized. Um, another critique, this one is maybe a bit more, uh, I don't know, this one really got my attention, is how one of the most sort of powerful features of witnessing maybe gets lost because of how survivors have to adapt themselves to this, this AI platform. Basically, in giving their answers, survivors have to keep quite concise. They need to be manageable length responses, and they need to keep their tone of voice quite dispassionate and consistent. Otherwise, if they become very emotional at one time, it's all going to get jumbled up in the conversation as it plays out. So there could be some really strange jumps in the sort of emotional register of the conversation. So witnesses have to keep quite sort of objective in how they're giving their response, which maybe neutralizes a little bit what is so powerful about testimony. But it is emotional and often it's unpredictable. It has sometimes unexpected digressions. The sort of spontaneity, energy, liveness maybe gets lost a bit because of how witnesses have to adapt themselves. AI appropriate answers only, if you please. Um, anyway, they go on. They, it, it's a, I think, a really interesting book. Some critiques I agree with, some I don't, but there's certainly some many, many things to think about. But coming back to that central question, what ultimately is the outcome of that collision? between apparent opposites, AI and witnessing. Firstly, I wanna give a shout out here to the grad students of the BAI forum. I couldn't, uh, your event happened before I could arrive, but I saw the advert and I underlined a part, but really was sort of, I needed to hear, it was at the right time for me to read this about not to fall into the trap of thinking in extremes when we think about AI, either optimistic or pessimistic. And I'm especially prone to the latter. Um, so I've really been trying to think, avoiding sort of catastrophic thinking. And I'm, with that in mind, I really feel like, based on this early stage, I don't see the sort of catastrophic outcome whereby the trust we tend to invest in testimony is suddenly spoiled or tainted by AI. I think it's really crucial that this testimony is pre-recorded, that nothing is generated, and although we can critique how it's edited and how it comes together, we can also critique that in regular video testimony and all the production that goes behind that as well. So it's not like that's unique to AI. It would be a different story if these testimonies were being chopped up into smaller pieces and rearranged by AI, but of course that is absolutely not happening. And key here, again, thinking of our, our work, Andy, the institution behind this, the Shoah Foundation, is an extremely you know, respected, trustworthy institution that's looking, that's obviously treating survivors very respectfully and carefully and not looking to do anything to compromise the integrity of their testimony. Um, and then based also on my conversations with curators, it's clear this has huge value in terms of engaging audiences. I've been told about um, people becoming really quite emotional in having these, these conversations with virtual survivors. So even if their tone is somewhat dispassionate, there's still heavy emotion in the room. And also for curators, often these are people they've known for years who have worked hard to establish the, the Holocaust exhibitions or museums that they are now presenting in. And so for curators, it's I think a really important way of keeping those personalities part of this institution. Um, but still the question to be answered, for the fundamental question maybe, is what does this actually add for visitors and users? If the same effect could be generated by pushing buttons on a screen or looking in the index of a book, how does selecting testimony in this way, what does it actually do? To some extent, this is something that me and, and Andrew and Tom are looking to answer more properly with some research hopefully happening next year. But for the time being, I've got some sort of speculative anecdotal thoughts with which I'd like to finish this lecture. And the first of these, sorry for being a, such a geographer, but it comes back to questions of space, proximity, closeness, and related questions of, of communality, being with other people, and ritual as well. Um, because while sites of difficult heritage, like again, the Hiroshima Museum, 
might be primarily educational in purpose, arguably commemorative, of course, education is also a big thing. They also have other functions. And just speaking of my own mind, one of these I think is kind of quasi religious in the sense of pilgrimage, of feeling the need to go on a physical journey to a place where people have, have suffered. And that is so significant for how we understand humanity. Um, this sort of pilgrimage element often involves completing certain rituals as if doing so enables a connection with the past. This is how I make sense of, of seeing people lining up to take exactly the same photo, which is already available perfectly online anyway. Um, I don't think it's so much about the content of the photo, perhaps, so much as the act of doing it, of completing it. And I'm not criticizing those people. I feel the same, exactly the same compulsion, partly wanting to have proof of having been there, but also in the moment, it just feels somehow necessary. Like what I'm doing there is incomplete if I don't have this, this thing, this, which seems to me kind of ritualistic behavior. And I just wonder if there's a similar function when it comes to simulating the presence of living witnesses, whether it's about providing an immersive sensation of just being close to a survivor. And in so doing, having a, a stronger connection to the past. I tell you, when this technology works, it really does feel like you're talking to that person. Now, that's, that's how I felt. And when I sat in a room with a group of other people equally sort of baffled at times by this, when it clicked, it did have a kind of religious affective feeling of gathering around the witness and completing that ritual. That experience, I would say, was more lasting in my mind than the actual contents of the testimony, which is not a criticism of the witness, but testament to how strong that feeling was. And so I wonder if providing that sense of co-presence and communality could even become one of the primary purposes of witnessing in an AI age, at least for events which are very well documented already. And again, mindful of the grad student's call to avoid catastrophic thinking, what, I, what I'm keen to do in this research, Andy, is to maybe focus on what kind of genuine value this brings to the museum and to the experience of users. I wonder if maybe having this sense of intimate connection and companionship could be a really important way to get people in the right mindset, emotional mindset, for taking on the incredibly difficult stories and histories of, of sites such as the Hiroshima Museum. Um, so that's, that's one. Then this question of, of spontaneity, liveness, which maybe is lost to some extent in the testimony of witnesses. But it, it's true, in order to fit their stories into this format, survivors do need to keep a neutral tone. And I imagine that's actually really difficult to sort of train themselves to do that. But maybe this is only this neutral tone is only a problem or a lack if we remain wedded to the idea that testimony is monological, going one way, as something issued by witnesses and received by audiences. What I think Dimensions in Testimony challenges us to do is really understand witnessing as a collective relational achievement, something which is a product of people working together, which again might sound dodgy in a legal context, but I think it's an option museums can embrace if it means strengthening visitors' engagement and trust in the institution. Because I'm gonna fully credit Boswell and Rowland here. They, they, they talk this through beautifully in their book Spontaneity does still exist in these interactive conversations, but it exists in the liveness and unpredictability and weirdness of the encounter itself between audience, survivor, and AI. That collective is where the spontaneity now exists. No two sessions of this technology will ever be the same. Questions will be asked in different orders some strange way of posing a question could prompt an entirely different response from the AI for completely different to how it's previously answered that type of question. Collective 
um, audiences will be very different to individual audiences and so on. So Aragoni and Galani make this point that digital testimonies are recorded and yet unique each time. And this is only this uniqueness, this spontaneity is only increased by what the geographers Sumatojo and Graves, I love this expression, they refer to the friction of digital interfaces, the friction, it's not smooth, things are rubbing up uncomfortably perhaps, failure, glitches, other breakdowns in this immersive experience. I'm now sort of calling back to my talk with Marcia from last year as well, because we were all about the failures of technology and how productive they can be. Boswell and Rowland use the term functional dysfunction to refer to the ways that dimensions in testimony breaks down, particularly the way that it sometimes misrecognizes questions and how actually this can be quite productive in surprising the audience and sort of making us understand with greater clarity what is this thing we're currently involved in. It might prompt greater reflection on the nature of collective memory. As, as they put it, Boswell and Rowland, asking us to recognize our responsibility for how testimony, how archives come into being. Um, I think testimony always has this ability, but I feel like dimensions in testimony really makes this explicit and challenges us to understand that testimony is always a relational collective achievement. It always relies on an active audience. And then this, this relates to my last point and this sense of connection that I think is so important for testimony. Um, I'll just be five more minutes, so probably just under 50 in total. Um, the last point I wanna make today is related to uh, another key concept in the literature around witnessing, which is the idea of identification, to identify the ability of audiences to empathize with and understand the situation of another person, a witness. This is, this is the fundamental thing that testimony does. But related to this idea is the concept of over-identification, where you experience such a strong emotional connection that you project yourself directly into the place of the witness, into a place of another person effectively erasing the distance and the difference between self and other. This is something critiqued a lot in the sort of psychoanalytic literature around trauma and witnessing. And it's seen as problematic for many reasons. Uh, one of which is how it, it can lead you, the audience, into a rather passive, hopeless sense of emotions that you can't really absorb or, or process, rather than, what is argued to be the, the preference, which is to motivate audiences to think about what can be done to help others who are not oneself. What I'm getting at here is that keeping distance between audiences and witnesses is super important. Even though you want this strong emotional connection, it's also obviously important to understand that the audience is not the witness. And this critique of over-identification has also been, come, has come to prominence in the work around digital technology, where the concern is that forms of immersion like virtual reality, which are all about making you think you're in the position of another person, could really lend themselves to this idea of over-identification. And maybe the collective memory of dimensions in testimony could be vulnerable to a similar criticism but it's placing all its emphasis on the audience as if they are the real witness. Again, catastrophic thinking perhaps, but actually what I would say is that this, this functional dysfunction, this ability to break down and surprise you is actually a powerful defense against over-identification. Every time this exchange fails, it's a reminder that the whole thing is a construction, that you are embroiled in, in a construction. And that's not a bad thing. That I would argue is true of every single testimony. Every act of witnessing is an act of artifice, of storytelling, arranging events into a coherent order that can be conveyed to others through technologies like language and gesture. What this AI 
assisted witnessing does though, is it transforms the artifice of testimony into this really effective, emotionally laden experience. You can feel viscerally the part you play in the construction. And the media scholar Kate Nash uh, makes a great point that if, if digital witnessing is gonna work, it needs to involve a sense of both presence and absence, closeness and distance. And I think that's something that Dimensions in Testimony does quite powerfully. It gives you a sense of presence, but it maintains an awareness of the artificial as well. The artificial intelligence of witnessing perhaps. So I'm, I'm, I'm now sort of <laughs> hitting the end of a very unfinished series of thoughts where I, it's gonna dribble into a bit of a conclusion, but what I'm speculating here is whether the way this thing makes the artifice of testimony explicit, it could have a real pedagogic value in providing a sense of transparency to the public about how collective memory and history works, how it's assembled and narrated. Collective memory doesn't just appear from the sky, it's not a natural thing. It is the product of careful interpretation, conversations with the past, frustration, uncertainty, or things you get a taste of by trying to converse with this virtual witness. So I wonder if audiences have the chance to experience that historicizing process themselves and in a self-reflective way, maybe greater trust and investment in museums is gonna follow. Already, it's gotten quite hot in this, in this shirt, at least I'm not sure how you're all feeling in the room, but the conclusion is just saying again what I just said. I, I, I really appreciate the grad students' points but we, you, you need to approach this in a sort of sober, and, uh, sober and, and careful way. And I've really appreciated the chance to do this in getting my thoughts together around this particular AI. I think there are critiques, but there's a lot of, a lot of promising stuff here and maybe in unexpected places. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much.